welcome to episode 219 of the Postal Hub podcast. I'm Ian Kerr. Brexit and the Stop Act will have significant impacts on the international mail stream and cross-border e-commerce. Data is crucial to avoid disaster. Martin Noble and David Spottiswood, co-founders of Hurricane Modular Commerce, join me in a moment to share their expert views Escher is transforming postal operators and couriers worldwide with its unique purpose-built customer engagement platform. With over 35 customers, Escher works with the most innovative posts in the world and their award-winning technology is used to serve over 1 billion citizens with 350 points of engagement globally. To learn how your post can drive superior customer experience with greater speed and better economics, visit Escher at eschergroup.com. Joining me on the line are Martin Noble and David Spottiswood, co-founders of Hurricane Modular Commerce. Martin, David, welcome. We're going to talk about a couple of major events that are going to have a significant impact on the landscape for cross-border e-commerce and for postal operators and I mean the whole shebang, I suppose, Brexit and the Stop Act. Why don't we start with Brexit? Uh, Martin, do you want to just set the scene for us? Where we're up to with Brexit? What, are the, what's, what stage are we at? I think, you know, we're, uh, by the time this goes out, Ian, uh, I think we're 30, 30 days to the day uh, when uh, Brexit Day uh, starts. In our view, not only just within the UK, but across the, uh, uh, the remaining 27 EU countries, I think it's uh, simple to say that it's uh, it planning ranges from excellent to, uh, to to chaotic from you know what we're seeing from uh, the many different segments of uh, the uh, the industry and uh, we, when you say it's ranging from was it excellent to chaotic yeah um, it, is it too late to start planning now or can can the whole situation be rescued if you if you're looking at making your plans for um, how you're going to deal with trade into or out of the UK post brexit no, I think there is enough information out there. If I particularly look at retailers, online retailers, market marketplaces, there is enough information out there to uh, to prepare for for Brexit Day. At the end of the day, you know, pre nineteen ninety two, this was a normal process um, where you had uh, customs declarations and various data declarations between uh, the EU. Uh, states and uh, the UK and vice versa. I think there is a perception out there, though, in that there's uh, customs officers and their bureaucratic requirements are bringing the world to this grinding halt. Um, I think the reality is very, very different. Uh, you know, most customs op- uh, authorities now operate sophisticated, automated uh, clearance facilities that just take a few moments for a uh, a shipment or a packet to uh, clear with the correct data and the uh, correct paperwork. I think you know the real problem is usually where the exporter or the importer has not complied with uh, the data requirements to import a shipment into uh, the country and have failed to supply the, uh, the the full and accurate data and documentation. People uh, do perceive Brexit as a UK Europe problem. And actually, you know, it is a global problem because once you start changing um, tariffs and uh, regulations in, in, in the UK, as an example, then that's not just Europe that needs to adjust their systems and the UK adjusting to European. It's also all other countries that import or export to those uh, geographies are also impacted. And I, I, I said recently, um, before COVID, I actually did a roadshow with one of our customers in um, in San Francisco and then in Australia, and the it was it almost came as a, a, a surprise that this would have an impact on those markets, but of course, data is data is data, and if you change one data set, that affects everybody. So I think I think the important bit about um, Brexit is, um, as Martin says. You know, there, there are different territories that are at different levels of readiness, but it but it is a global uh, a global challenge, that's for sure. And you just mentioned data, and data is almost at the centre of what's happening with the USA's Stop Act, which comes into force very soon as well. 
you know, the Stop Act is is actually, in, in my view, a very sensible uh, move in the sense of, you know, the requirements to have the correct data and advanced data describing what's in a package coming into your country. That's a very logical move. However, that does present a lot of challenges for a lot of um, logistics companies who have not in the past been required to do that. And it will be quite a hard uh, step. Martin, what, what's your thoughts on that? Yes, I think, you know, a lot on a, on a lot of these uh, podcasts that you do, Ian, you very much talk about last mile innovation. And if we cast the clock back sort of eight to 10 years, we were all talking about the first mile, last mile as the strategic advantage for, for anyone that really wanted to make uh, headway into uh, the global e-commerce market. I think now that's, that's very much changed. It's actually about that first file last mile. If you look at the way our, our world has transformed in digitization, automation of processes, freedom for the e-shopper, um, to buy for something, you know, shop for something unique, shop for something that is at a better price. The whole volume shift means that we need to get that data absolutely correct at, uh, uh, at source because uh, it's not only the e-commerce world that's, that's um, undergone sort of like digital transformation, processes have, customs authorities have, and everything is triggered and moves by data nowadays. Um, so get that piece right, uh, you smooth your operation uh, for the various pain points that you may encounter uh, along your shipment movement path. The, the way the world has moved is, you know, it is all about data. It is all about advanced data and accurate data. And, and that smooths the physical flow of, uh, of parcels. And, and that's, that's true not just for, you know, as, as we we're saying, not, not just for the coming uh, January deadline with the Stop Act, but the whole Brexit piece as well is, is going to be reliant on advanced quality data to allow the, the free movement of goods. So let's look at this from a postal operator's perspective. You've got the Stop Act, you've got Brexit, and growing cross-border trade through the postal stream. And, and Martin just mentioned the importance of data. Well, we both have mentioned the importance of data. So what are the implications for posts if they're not ready for these, these seismic shifts in cross-border trade? I think the first thing to recognise, Ian, is is very very much the postal players uh, are about to embark on four amount, immense challenges with, uh, you know, the, not only Brexit uh, that's around data. Uh, you have the Stop Act uh, for exportation into uh, North America. Uh, you have ICS two um, uh, in uh, March. Uh, and you've also got the VAT changes uh, in in July, and there's there's some immense changes there. But also to recognise that you know 2020 has also been a, a year of immense change because of the the pandemic. You know, not only in postal authorities having to care for their staff, put in place uh, measures around their operation for for health and safety, uh, and to deliver to customers in an innovative fashion that is that is safe for all, all parties concerned. So I think you know, it is about recognising those, those, those immense challenges, but it's actually around data. Now, in terms of getting into uh, the e-commerce market, you know, there's, what, 106 million e-commerce cross-border packets every single year. We know that 70% of that, so 70-odd 70, 70 billion, uh, is carried by uh, the, the postal players. And we know, because of the behavioural changes that uh, have, have impacted uh, strategically on um, the way the world purchases, uh, the way that we operate as businesses because of the, the, the pandemic, you know, some of those growth rates here are up 60% year on year in, in August. So you've got this huge volume shift going on at the moment and um you know a couple of uh, our customers have, have actually stated you know even pre this period that we're in the normal peak period they were doing 20 percent above peak from the previous year so you've got this huge volume uh conundrum going on and i think the the, the way to 
to solve some of these issues is actually look at your data processes. How are you validating that that data? How are you checking that, that data? And how are you harnessing technology stacks to make that pro- process drive the unit cost of that process down, but improve the accuracy of that process at the same time? The whole point around um, the challenge that faces the post at the moment is, as Martin says, you know, the majority of e-commerce is is uh, moved around the world by the post. I think you probably mentioned this on your previous uh, podcast, Ian, that the post, you know, they have the last mile infrastructure, but, you know, bigger than anybody in the world. And, you know, but the bit that they've, they've not had to concentrate on is that is that um, complete data. Um, so that that's their biggest challenge at the moment, I think. And I think a number of them, you know, are stepping up very well to it. Um, I think there's some, you know, as, as Martin said as well, there's some very hard deadlines that are real. Um, and, you know, not least the, the North American one on January the 1st, um, which which if enforced as is 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 being is as is being stated, then you will have an enormous amount of uh, operational um, complexities to deal with 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 refused parcels. Now, I wanted to delve into that really briefly. It's something we hinted at a little bit with uh, the interview I did with Kate Muth from IMAG a few weeks ago, was what's going to happen with regard to things like bottlenecks or even parcels being refused at the border in the case of the STOP Act. Bearing in mind that the USA is a big market, there are plenty of e-commerce shoppers uh, in the USA. Mm. And as you said, that percentage of parcels coming in via the post. So what could we be looking at if if um, other posts or e-commerce sellers aren't prepared properly here and they're not sending that correct data through with the shipments going into the USA? You know, we've done a little bit of a, I, I guess, a finger in the air. You know, if you take the, the number of parcels that are moved currently by the posts into North America and then you look at, you know, the percentage that have the complete data requirement, you know, you could be looking up upwards of what Martin six, seven hundred million parcels being rejected at the border. Now, you know, anybody from a logistics background, <laughs> seven hundred million parcels being being refused and returned, and that's not our statement, by the way. That's USPS's statement. They will be refused and returned. That will create a huge logistics nightmare for the operators themselves. It'll, in, you know, it'll incur a huge cost to somebody. And, you know, being very blunt, it'll <laughs> incur a huge, huge dissatisfaction for the customer and the retailers. So I think, I think you know, the, the logistical nightmare of, you know, how do you, how do you translate that statement refused and returned into what happens physically is going to be quite, you know, I think is going to be quite dramatic. Um, so, Martin, what, what's your thoughts? I mean, you know, we talk about this a lot, right? I think I think it's really interesting around um, how the stop act has has actually been been played out, and you've got these sort of like statements that that have gone out that that basically say shipments will be returned, and you know within some of the reports that uh, we've seen on on uh, the whole stop act, uh, there's various recommendations about either help hold the shipment or undertake controlled deliveries, so on and so forth. I think what we've got to remember here is that, you know, as myself and David, uh, we are ex-operators and we've done quite sizable operations in uh, in many different industries. Most of these service centres are designed uh, and purchased for quick flow through at a certain period within the day to meet your pickup, your delivery, your line haul schedule, so on and so forth. They're not actually designed to store. And I think, you know, if you just look at that small analysis that that we've done and you look at multi-million packages having to be stored i don't know where they're going to be going to be stored so then what's your option uh you put them on a return flight do we actually have the air cargo capacity around the around the globe because you know we we still don't have the same amount of flights going around the world on a day-to-day basis with that capacity in the cargo holds and you know, we've seen a great big rise in in cargo, uh, uh, pure car- cargo uh, uplift. But when you start talking these volumes, how does that then get get returned? And as David said earlier, who pays for that? And then, you know, 
What about the green impacts of that as well? Because, you know, at the end of the day, because you haven't got one singular piece of data right on or correct uh, or compliant on an individual item that rolls up to a consignment that may roll up to a, a, a ULD, a loading device or, or, or container, um, the whole thing then grinds to uh, a halt. And I, I just think it's... It's 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 very very interesting, uh, and will be very interesting on the uh, you know particularly the second of January to uh, to see how this actually plays out and what uh, Customs and Border Patrol in the United States actually do. We're talking about January the first, but remember through post, most parcels will have left way before then. So so you, it's not January the first is when the problem starts. The problem is actually going to start pretty much when when the parcels ordered right so uh, yeah well what you've both just been talking about uh, in particular martin your point about returning non-compliant parcels just brings to mind what happened in sweden uh, not that long ago when the government said right that's it we're going to start imposing vat so the the, the value added tax on all shipments coming in from wherever including china the low value shipments from china and the postal operator had to come up with a very quick solution. And then what was the next problem? That consumers weren't willing to pay a tax to release their shipments. And if they weren't willing to pay the tax to release their shipments, those shipments were returned to China in this case, sure. in this example. And at the other end, the e-commerce operators, they weren't prepared for you know shipping containers to be arriving at their dock. What do we do with this stuff? It's, it's worth $1 or one euro. We're not going to process that back into China. So the environmental impact, goodness only knows what yeah. happened there, um, but certainly it did drive those e-commerce websites in China to be compliant with um, collecting VAT and all of those sorts of things. But with this volumes that you are talking about here, the environmental impact could be significant. Even if those returns are sent via ship to, say, China or whatever um, the source country is, it's still a significant cost. So do you think, can, I guess, two questions then. One, are consumers aware of this, <laughs> what the potential environmental cost could be? And two, uh, you know, um, is this going to in turn drive um, compliance, shall we say, from whether it's posts or e-commerce retailers or whoever. Okay, so just dealing with the first, with the first question, you know, if we if we sit back and we uh, look through the lens of history, uh, national governments, coalitions of governments, they will always tax something that's high growing because they can get income out of it. So you know, there becomes as you as you said, there there's the issue. What do I do as a company or anyone in that consumer supply chain? What do I do? What do I do? What do I then do about it? I've got to find a solution. And I think actually the solution to that is the demonstration of duties and taxes in a shopping cart or when you're browsing. So there is complete and utter price transparency, sorry to use a, an industry terminology, but of the fully landing cost of the purchase of that, uh, that, that product and that, that good. So the consumer makes the choice before the good has even been picked from a shelf or has been loaded. So solve the problem at the source. And this goes back to my point around you know, first file, last mile that first file that first interaction you can prevent that inefficiency by making that e-shopper absolutely aware of what the fully landed cost is going to to cost them so i think i think you know that that that's num that's number one david do you want to take the uh the, the second point yeah i just just filling in on on the first one again was you know Martin's absolutely right. You know, how many of us anecdotally have had a, and I think you just had a package in delivered and somebody said, is there a cost? Well, you know, if, if you're, I've often, because we, we, we do this, I often buy off websites and I have the shipment delivered to my house and then the delivery agent says, oh, I need another 30 bucks for duties and taxes. And I say to them, no, I'm not going to pay that because you didn't tell me. And they say, well, yeah, but that's not my problem. That's the retailer's problem. I talked to the retailer and the retailer said, oh, it's not my problem. 
And I say, well, it is because I'm not going to shop on your website anymore because my contract was not including this, this fee. So I think to Martin's point, that customer experience, the retailers really, really get it um, because they're looking for repeats. Um, and I think also the, the postal logistics companies actually don't want to be ca collecting cash on the doorstep. That's not very efficient. <laughs> so that's the uh, And then, sorry, the second point, Ian, you were making was? Environmental emissions and cargo capacity. Yeah, no, I think, I think you know, th this is something that's very close to our hearts and, you know, one of the areas that we look at quite closely that, you know, if you look at, um, as Martin alluded to earlier, the cargo capacity globally is in high demand, but there isn't a lot of it at the moment. Um, and that's and that's purely if you look at, you know, some of the postal operators, they rely on their national airline uh, to move the material. And most of the air aircraft, as we all know, are not moving at the moment. So you've got that issue. Um, and then, you know, when we look at the that whole returns piece, you know, that whole supply chain is is just doubling and tripling that, you know, the, the emissions and, and the damage to the environment. So I think I think, you know, there's there's a lot of areas that that we look at that are not you know necessarily primarily focused on you know the original purchase and the uh, the original movement there's such a spider web of things that get impacted and and it all comes back to you know again as as we talked earlier you know if i know i'm going to get charged a certain amount of duties and taxes when that shipment's delivered and i'm told that before i've actually bought it then my decision is informed and I'm, I'm not going to have what they call the doorstep surprise. You know, if I'm not told that, then, you know, that has all of those implications that I've talked about. At the heart of what we've been talking about today has been data on one side of it and getting the data right. Another part has been complying with laws and regulations that are imposed by governments, even foreign governments, because we live in an inter interconnected world. From a postal operator's perspective then, what, what do they have to do to get it right? And what are the opportunities there if they do get it right in terms of whether it's, whether it's capturing more business, being more efficient or all those sorts of things? Or perhaps, Martin, I might start with you. Okay. So I think in the whole of the, uh, the, the data conundrum, shall we say, I think you know, focus on missing or, or incomplete data, uh, vague or misleading descriptions in item contents, missing an incorrect HS6 code, so making sure that the commodity descriptions match up with the HS6 codes. Uh, I think incomplete shipper and consignee data. Look at some of those uh, those contents, uh, those goods, uh, really review what special licenses they may, re may require to the importing country. I think, you know, there's, there's another huge element as well um, around the valuation of those contents and, um, you know, I think that that really needs to be looked at. Uh, another one that's very, very important, particularly on prohibited and restricted goods uh, in and out of countries is uh, countries of origin. Uh, where was the country of origin of those, uh, the, those goods? Uh, and I think the other area as well that we haven't really touched on, but from a compliance angle is, is a very, very hot topic with some uh, high profile fines being issued uh, over the quarter one and quarter two of, of 2020 is that of denied parties and the your operations denied party screening. So I think in detail, uh, it's around all of, the, all of those data pieces, how are they collected, where are they collected, how do we verify them, how do we verify them before they go on to shipping manifest or customs man manifest, and how do we check that all the time? Uh, I think the Second part of your question there around the opportunity is actually look at this as, as an opportunity to enhance the business model, particularly with uh, B2C and B2B uh, e-commerce. Um, and go back to where we, we, we started with, where, where is the inefficiency? It's right at the source, the data, the data at the source of the transaction. So how can I build a business model that enhances that and stops the issues being created right at source? How do I deploy mechanisms that not only are 
um, enhanced through my my existing uh, customer shipping platforms. Uh, but the the whole customer experience on behalf of my merchant, my online retailer, uh, is is all enhanced, and we're getting that information on duties and taxes and product descriptions and commodity descriptions absolutely accurate at source and you know the route to do that is despite the whole high volumes um those technology stacks are available nowadays 20 odd years ago they weren't it was very paper based but you can utilize the appropriate technology to a improve your process reduce your unit costs reduce your shipment failure rate uh, and absolutely shift the needle, which is what the regulations are requiring, shift the needle on your data quality. An, an emerging trend over the last of 10 years or so has been posts partnering with private operators as well when it comes to um, delivering cross-border. So it might start with the post and end up with a private operator. Are there any special challenges there or is it still just sort of the same, the same kind of thing? David, I might get you to have a crack at this one, please. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that, that's a, you know, it's a logical uh, move from, from the posts and, and private operators working together. But, but, you know, in one sense, it kind of enhances what we've been saying is, you know, the private operators over the years have always had to have, uh, or the integrators, I would say, have always majored on um, good quality data uh, because, the, you know, there's always been a difference in the clearance channels, right, between post and, and private operators. So the fact that it's sort of a level playing field now just just goes to say that, you know, what we've said throughout this this whole podcast is, you know, the, the post, the post, you know, really – their move is to enhance that that data that they're providing, but the fact that they're using and and partnering with private operators is is actually not new. You know, the the Martin and I come from a private operator, and 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 we work with Post for twenty years, I guess. But but the need for quality data um, is 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 there because the, it's now a level playing field. Yeah, Mark, do you got something on that? Yeah, and I, I think what's really important is you know for a for an efficient getting greener global transportation system you need those collaborative elements and then you know this whole podcast has been about the data what makes that even more important is you're transferring data across different legal entities in that chain particularly as the the as is uh, increased collaboration take, takes impact um so Within that, you also have data leakage. So you've got to be checking that data at each point yeah. of handoff. Um, and I think that's really, really, really important. And I think, you know, the the postal authorities have a huge opportunity to not only grow their market share, uh, of which they've got 70 odd percent of uh, B2C e-commerce at this moment in time, um, but they've also got to retain that. And they've then got to add value to that. Um, and through whatever their transport system systems are with those collaborations, uh, the data, the data leakage, the data rechecking and, and keeping that that whole quality of data all the way through from exportation to point of importation has to be absolutely solid. We've talked about B to B. We've talked about B to C. What about the final frontier? C to C and getting the data right on those shipments and making sure that people avoid, what did you call it, David, the doorstep surprise, which is not when you get a gorilla gram and somebody singing a happy birthday dressed in a gorilla <laughs> suit. Um, is there anything that can be done there or are the volumes so small that we just have to forget about it and just hope for the best? No, I, no, I think I, if I pick that one, Martin, I think, mm. I think look, the data is the data is the data, right? And and although the C to C volumes from a post you know, a relatively small compared to their overall business, it's still the same problem when it hits customs. Customs don't recognize whether it's come from, you know, a big retailer or, you know, my 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 grandmother, right? If the parcel doesn't have the data, it stops the flow. Right. So so the C to C is actually hugely important. You know, as I said, although it represents a minor proportion of the overall global flow, from a customs perspective, they look for trusted uh, partners, right? So, who, so when a parcel comes in, no matter which channel it's coming from, does it have the right data? So, for, for us, 
you know, we 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 see we see a parcel with the right data wherever it's come from. Martin. Yeah, I think what's really interesting is uh, in that C to C piece, the marketplaces, uh, the e-commerce platforms uh, are already starting to look at this problem um, because you know certainly the uh, the, the marketplaces uh, they've approached my Davis company to look at exactly this, this issue. They want to get into the cross border. Um, opportunity uh they want their product listers to engage more internationally currently they're running around about 20 percent of their listings are uh are, are um allowable let's say um for cross-border in a c2c transaction they actually want to shift that over a period of two, two years to 80 percent in And they're looking at exactly this issue. How do I support that individual like ourselves, maybe found a leather jacket up in the loft. We want to we want to put it up. We think it's sellable and we want to sell it to someone in Singapore. Um, Now, you know, we're all from in and around this, 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 this industry. But the the normal C to C uh, type type movement, they won't be knowing about product descriptions commodity descriptions hs6 codes so i think they're the the onus is on you know the marketplaces the e-commerce platforms um and the postal authorities to help that c2c consumer and make it you know simplify the complex for them in a term so engage in systems where you know that leather jacket that we found up in the loft and we want it we want to sell it we go on we list it and automatically when we've listed that product it's classified and a hs6 six code is accurate and then whatever transport mechanism we utilize that data is then transferred into that transport management system and then goes through the uh, the whole shipment flow and information flow that atta- is attached to that that shipment flow and they're already doing that if anyone wants to find out more about hurricane modular commerce martin where should they go first port of call is please go to our website uh, www.hurricanecommerce.com or uh, give you a call in well, give me a call <laughs> <laughs> sorry I couldn't miss it. don't call me everyone goodness me next to be giving out my phone number on air we won't have any of that well, full credit to both of you for not mentioning drones during this interview. I'm sure the temptation was huge. Um, so, uh, again, I'll put a link on the podcast listing on the postalhub.com to the Hurricane Modular Commerce website so you can get in contact with Martin or David and the team there to find out more about the, what did you call it, the data mile? No, what was it called? The data file. First file, last mile. First file to the last mile. Martin Noble and David Spotterswood, co-founders of Hurricane Modular Commerce. Thanks for joining me on the Postal Hub podcast today. Thanks a lot, Ian. Coming soon on the Postal Hub podcast, Dr. Joanna Wu Gerhardt from the USPS OIG on Generation Z and Mail, Tom Day from the IPC on emissions in the postal sector, Jonathan Reeve from Eagle Eye on subscription models, and Mara Krzyzewski and Dean McCuba from Last Mile Experts will join me in December to pick over the major trends in the last mile. You can subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, on Google Podcasts, and on other podcasts platforms and while you're at it give the podcast a rating a five star rating and a review please that'd be nice thank you think of it as your christmas present to me do you have an email address put it to good use sign up for the postal hub e newsletter a free weekly email newsletter with the latest podcast and any other items i've written during the week go to the postalhub.com and sign up there and if you want to contact me about anything at all drop me a line via email my email address is ian at the postalhub.com i'm ian kerr thanks for listening in and i look forward to your company next time on the postal hub podcast <laughs>